later. And she couldn't take it anymore. And she finally said, whoever started this whole Christmas thing should be found strung up and shot. A quiet, calm voice from the back of the elevator responded, don't worry, we already crucified him. We've made it, we've made it to the cross. We're going to Golgotha today. Last Sunday, we, we looked at the night of a prayer on the Mount of Olives. After that, Jesus is arrested. And then we pick up in Mark chapter 15 and verse 1. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. So here's Jewish religious leadership. And they bound Jesus, and led him away, delivered him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Now, as we keep working through Mark 15 today, just kind of notice how much this idea of the king of the Jews comes up. Right? And Jesus answered, you have said so. We drop down to verse 12. You know, Pilate's trying to, to not have to uh, do something bad to, to Jesus, you know, real bad to Jesus. And so he's going to try to offer him, uh, you know, Barabbas. And Pilate again in verse 12 said to the crowd this time, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And they clothed him in purple cloak, twisted together a crown of thorns. So you get a purple cloak and you get a crown for the idea of kingship. And they put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail! king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. You know, hail, king of the Jews, corresponds to the standard Roman acclamation, Hail, Caesar. Kind of amazing what's going on here. And Jesus is anointed with their spit and crowned with thorns and prepared to be enthroned on the cross. They compelled a passerby, Simon Cyrene, who is coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They brought him to the place called Golgotha. Well, this, this depiction you have there out just bottom, kind of bottom center of your screen, a little hill, Golgotha, three crowns on it. Mark, Mark translates the Hebrew name, which means place of the skull for his readers. The term uh, that often gets used here is Calvary, and that comes from the Latin word for skull. Okay. There's possible reasons why this would be called the place of the skull. Some think that the little mound looked like a skull. All right. Some said, well, that's where he found skulls at, right? Because it was a location for executions. I don't know if any of those are right or they're all right, you know? <laughs> uh, but that's what Mark says that it means. 
And in the text in verse 23, notice they offered him this wine mixed with myrrh, and he didn't take it. And, you know, that'd have some sort of narcotic effect upon him to deaden the, the pain, but he's not, he's not going to do that. He's ready to drink the cup of the wrath of God. And they crucified him. And divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide which each should take. Mark doesn't go into any con, uh, you know, detail about the process of crucifixion, how he was fastened to the cross, what type of cross was used, how excruciating the pain was. That's all. That's all left out of Mark's account. Luke and Luke and John are clear that Jesus was nailed to the cross at both his wrist and his feet. And nearly everyone in the ancient world knew that cruci what crucifixion was like. So Mark didn't have to go into much detail there. And my guess is you've all heard good crucifixion sermons with details. And so I don't think I have to go into much detail either. But we can all say it's horrid, you know. And the text tells us that the soldiers are there dividing up Jesus's belongings. It's typical for soldiers to do that. A little bit of personal stuff a crucified person has, they, they divide up. So it's not only customary, though. In this case, it also fulfills scripture. From Psalm 22 and verse 18, they divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Mark tells us that the time of the crucifixion is the night is uh, the third hour, which is nine a.m. And we notice then the notice of the charge against Jesus is given to us in verse twenty-six. The inscription of the charge against him read: "Here it is again for us." He's an insurrectionist. He thinks he's king. He's king of the dead. Isn't that interesting? Do, do you remember how, I, I don't care which gospel account you go with, but Jesus pretty well resists all political overtones to his ministry. Mark is really clear with his, what gets labeled as the messianic secret. When, uh, when people know that he's the Christ the Messiah, you have this shh. Don't tell anybody. Repetition throughout the gospel. And part of that's because they'd have political overtones and, you know, not supposed to. And yet, still at the end, at the cross, king of the Jews. And it seems pretty clear by the repetition of that phrase that that's what's at issue here in Mark 15. Verse 27 tells us that he's crucified with two outlaws. These are, these are, are robbers. These are violent men of, of some sort going on. Not only are you experiencing the agony of the cross, but then there's the mocking of Jesus. People passing by, they derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. You know, the, the crucified, as far as I can tell, customarily, you know, receive quite a bit of verbal abuse. And it seems like, you know, for some perverse reason, some people relish witnessing the agony of others. I don't get it, but there are people wound that way, it seems like, and they enjoy adding to the misery. And also, you have people that often mock what they don't understand. And so I think you've got all that going on in this case. 
the <clears throat> ESV has, they derided him. This is your word for blasphemed, right? That's the charge that the high priest gives for Jesus in Mark chapter 14, verse 40, uh, 64, excuse me. And now, now the crowd is blaspheming against Jesus. And so if you're, reading, if you're reading through Mark's gospel, he's laying it out here in, in the narrative flow to say, as, as a reader, I've got to decide who's the true blasphemer here. Is, is, it, is it like, is, is, is it Jesus? Right? Like the high priest said, is he the one? Or are the true blasphemers this crowd going on? Right? You, you got to make a, a decision about that and direct your life accordingly. And they're, they're shaking their heads in, in a gesture of, of contempt. And, and they're taunting him about destroying the temple and raising it back up again. That issue came back. Uh, came up at chapter 14 and verse 58. So the passers-by know this. And they mock Jesus. But they're not the only ones to mock Jesus. Religious leaders mock Jesus. Chief priests, scribes, mocked him to one another saying, I saved others, he can't save himself. Here we go again. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Do you really think that that's what they were wanting to do? I don't. Or they wouldn't be talking like this. But they say he saved others, you know, because they, they, they can't perceive, they can't perceive how, how God could be with someone so abandoned so tormented on the cross. I thought if Jesus was really indeed Savior, he ought to be able to save himself. See a typical selfish outlook on the world. Right? And Jesus did save others. We've read through the Gospel of Mark, haven't we? There's plenty of people he saved in the Gospel of Mark. But that's really not the major intent of his mission, is it? Jesus himself would say in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45, I came to give my life. My life is a ransom for many. And it is, mark this down, it's precisely because Jesus did not come down from the cross that we do have a Savior. All right? It's precisely, if he had come down from the cross, we wouldn't have a savior. These guys don't have a clue what they're talking about. I'm thankful Jesus did. But that's not enough mocking. It's not just enough for the passersby to mock at Jesus. And it's not just enough for the religious leaders to mock Jesus. Oh no, the crucified outlaws have to mock him too, right? You know, they reviled him. So he gets taunted by, by those guys to, to add to the humiliation, to add to the shame. Crucified. Mocked. You come to the death of Jesus, verse 33. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That means we've been on the, Jesus has been on the cross for three hours now, and it's noontime. Luke, Luke just says the sun failed. The sun failed. And this darkness covers the whole land for three hours. And at that ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why did he say 
forsaken me. You know, these are, you, you probably all, have, you know, I've done it, you know, the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross, you know, based on nice little sermon series, yeah. This is, these are the only words of the cross that Mark records. Mark wants us to focus on, if we're going to focus on what Jesus says, this is what he wants us to focus on. And the words, the words come from Psalm 22 and verse 1. And that this has to be, I mean, history's got plenty of low points. But this has got to be the lowest, doesn't it? This is, this is the scandal of the incarnation. This is the, the rupture of eternal fellowship. This is the worst place to be. God forsaken. That is the absolute worst place to be. But you know what? Jesus' death isn't a tragic failure. But it's the fulfillment of scripture. It's the fulfillment of God's purpose. Jesus is the substitute for sin. He's being abandoned at, by the Father as the sacrifice for sin. Isaiah would say it this way in Isaiah 53 and verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grave. When his soul makes an offering for guilt. Paul would put it this way over in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. Or maybe just go with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For our sake. It's us. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's amazing, isn't it? The innocent going to the cross for the guilty so that we could be the righteousness of God. Oh, I know I got a savior like this, don't I? You know? You know? Verse 35, some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled, uh, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come take him down. Now, the scoffers here either mis misunderstood Jesus' statement, right? They, they, they heard the Eloi, Eloi, and thought that's Elijah. Or maybe, maybe they're deliberately distorting his words in jest. And maybe they're they're trying to give him this uh, this wine on the on the sponge to you know give him a little more energy to enable him to hold off death until you know Elijah comes flying down on his chariot out of out of the heavens to to pick him up you know well, that's not what happened is it Jesus uttered Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. You know what, that day on Golgotha, that day on Golgotha, three men died. Two were guilty and one was innocent. That day on Golgotha, three men died. Two were robbers in life and one was robbed of life. That day on Golgotha, three men died. Two were transgressors, and one died for transgressions. 
And when, when he breathes his last, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. A miraculous sign from God that calls attention to the momentous nature of the death of Jesus. And it, it's surely significant that each of the synoptic gospels, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, records the rending of the temple veil as a direct consequence of the crucifixion of Jesus. What Jesus has endured and accomplished in association with and brought to, to bear upon the temple its significance and its function. Yeah, his death has something to do with the temple. Because now, remember Moses on the mountain? I want to I want to see your glory, God. Y'all, you can't see my face and live. You know, we're gonna build God this tabernacle temple, and he's gonna be partitioned off by the veil. As Jesus dies, God shows his face. Jesus' crucifixion opens the way to God and is itself the revelation of the face of God. The Son fulfilled his mission of opening a new way of access to the Father. And then Mark's crucifixion account ends with a Roman soldier. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. You know, this is apparently the Roman guy in charge of the crucifixion. And he makes this remarkable confession for a Roman soldier. Son of God in the Roman Empire is a term used and kept for and reserved for the emperor. That's what they claim for themselves. And now you've got a soldier use the term that's re reserved for the emperor saying, this man, this term applies to this man. He bestows this, this title on a Jew who's just been executed. Now he probably is speaking far more than what he understands. But even what he understands is remarkable for him, isn't it? You know, and this is, this is one of four important texts in Mark about Jesus being son of God. You have it as he opens this gospel, you know. It's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Mark says this, this is what this is about. Jesus is Christ, son of God. He's the king. He's God's chosen one. He's his anointed one. He's God's king. And then you have it there at his baptism. Voice came from heaven. You're my beloved son. You say, Johnson, that doesn't say son of God. Well, who do you think is speaking? Right? And if who's speaking says son, guess what that makes him? Son of God. Right? And then a couple of three weeks ago, we were at Mount of Transfiguration. And again, a voice comes out of heaven. You know, this is my beloved son. Guess who he is? He's son of God. Listen to him. And now, and now the centurion. See, he understood. There, there's something about this that this is God's king. And we better, we better pay attention to him. And we need the same confession that the centurion made. There were three crosses that day on Golgotha. There was the cross of redemption. That's what we've looked at. And without that cross of redemption, none of us would have any hope. The innocent went there for the guilty. I'm telling you, we've got to deep down in our souls appreciate the cross of redemption. But that's not the only cross that day. There was also the cross of rebellion, right? 
there's, there's, there's the robber who's hurling abuse at Jesus. And he's, he's dying because he's in rebellion. He's, he's in rebellion to the Roman authorities. He's in rebellion to God, you know. Cross of rebellion. But you know, there's a third cross. There's a cross of repentance. When you read Luke's account, there's, there's one robber who starts hurling abuse and then he pulls back and he tells the other guy to shut up. Yeah, that's Johnson's interpretation, uh, you know, <laughs> really loose uh, translation of Luke. But that's basically what he does. And Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Three men died, three crosses that day. You know what? All... All three cross realities are still available to everyone today, are they not? There's still the real possibility of being in rebellion. But there's still the real possibility of repentance. And thankfully, there's the reality of the cross of redemption. The question is... Which cross represents you this morning? Isn't that the question? I mean, it's we, we can talk about, you know, how gory and bad and painful that death was. But at the end of the day, we've got to ask, you know, which cross represents me? Am I, am I in rebellion against God this morning? Do, do I need to, you know, may, maybe I've, I've never come in to the cleansing blood of Christ or the cross of redemption. And so, so this morning is the time to do it, all right, to, to understand that Jesus is indeed the king, God's king. And I'm going, I'm going to repent. I'm going to change the way I go about things. And I'm going to start to live in harmony with my king. And I'm going to confess him with my mouth that he is king. And be united with him in, in that watery grave of baptism and come up and have new life in the kingdom of God. Maybe we need to do that this morning. Or maybe we've done that and, you know, this world's got a way of 